what comes to mind when you hear robotic process automation? Does it conjure thoughts of physical robots taking over jobs? Have you ever felt like a robot whenever you do mind-numbing, repetitive work? Hi, I'm Alicia Butler-Pierre. There's no shortage of myths and misconceptions when it comes to robotic process automation. And we're about to hear from an executive and expert technologist who will give us the 411 on what it is and what it isn't. Yes, it's totally possible for small businesses to leverage robotic technology to work with us in streamlining our operations and not against us. And you might be surprised at how much time it can free up working on administrative tasks, time that can be used on revenue generating activities instead. This is season 14, episode 172. Let's start the show. Welcome to Business Infrastructure, the podcast about curing back office blues of fast growing businesses. If you're a business owner or operator looking for practical tips and solutions to scaling your business in a sustainable manner, you're in the right place. Now, here's your hostess, Alicia Butler Pierre. Having a tough time trying to explain ideas over a video conference? Try the Think Smart whiteboard. It's the fastest whiteboard software in the world and allows you to upload flowcharts and write on them while your colleagues are watching remotely. Call us today for a free demo. The number is 1 866 584 6804 or visit us online at getmytablet.com. Now that's smart. Think smart. Today's episode is brought to you by Equilibria. Is your small business experiencing unmanageable growth? We have proven solutions to scale your fast-growing business with less pain by hiring the right people, implementing the right processes, and leveraging the right technologies. Learn more at eqbsystems.com. It's season 14, everybody, and we're exploring game-changing technology. And it is with great honor that I introduce today's guest, Dean Hamilton. He's joining us from Cupertino, California. I can honestly say, Dean, I, I don't think I've ever met anyone. I, I hear about Cupertino all the time, of course, because of Apple, but I've never met anyone who actually lives there. So, so this is also a treat. Dean is a partner and chief technology officer at Wilson Paramol and Company, where they help companies thrive in today's age of complexity. Forbes.com once listed Dean as one of the top eight technology CEOs to watch. He's going to share with us how they dramatically improve their clients' back office operations with robotic process automation, also known as RPA. Dean, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm well. Thanks for having me, Alicia. Thank you so much. Now, just so everyone will know how we met, we actually met through your colleague, Scott Stalbum. Did I pronounce Scott's last name correctly? Yeah, close enough. Okay, close. okay. <laughs> I take it that's a no, <laughs> if it's close enough. But And the way that happened, Dean, I'm not even sure if, if you know this, but I happened to be looking for some information, graphical design information on the web that centered around operational excellence. And lo and behold, I came across an infographic that your company produced. And that's what I shared. And Scott happened to see that on LinkedIn. And that's how he and I connected. And that's ultimately what led us to meeting each other. And as I was reading more about you and your background, it's so clear that you've had a long history, 30 years to be exact, of success in the IT space, including several companies that you've started and some that you've even sold, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I've, I've uh, been blessed to, I've been in Silicon Valley here from the uh, very early days of the uh, computing microprocessor revolution. And I've had, a, had the opportunity to work at some pioneering companies and then to start some of my own. Your career started as a software engineer, right? Yeah, that's right. I started out as a software engineer um, building uh, uh, mostly uh, telecommunications products. I was focused on uh, real-time embedded drivers, uh, software drivers for real-time embedded communication products, and came up the uh, up the ranks, you know, as a uh, a manager, a director of engineering, 
and then shifted over to the business side, um, starting my first company back in 1994. Mm. And then um, um, have been on the uh, sort of general management technology company, general management uh, and innovation side um, since then. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was wondering, how did you make that transition from being what, you know, a technician slash software engineer and into the C-suite? So did, did you start your own business first before you had your, uh, your first executive level position at another company outside of the one that you owned? Yes, that, that, that's right. I, I, um, you know, sort of, um, never actually, you know, while I was in the engineering, uh, ranks and coming up there, I, I don't think I'd ever considered doing a startup or running my own company as a, as a CEO, Mm-hmm. But I just happened to have been at a company that was sold. One of the companies where I was a director of engineering had been sold to a, a large Canadian company. And uh, after the acquisition, they decided they wanted to move all the engineering jobs to Ottawa. And, um, you know, mm-hmm. in those days, most Silicon Valley engineers wouldn't move to Ottawa, right? That's not, <laughs> <laughs> it sounds so exciting. Yeah, it wasn't like a, 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 a peak technology hub at the time. <laughs> and so I was, you know, stuck with, you know, kind of, well, what do I do? Do I, uh, I'm not going to move. Do I, you know, look for another engineering job? And I had built a team and that team was a very good team and they were sort of all facing the same thing. Do we kind of just go to the four winds? And, and one of my team members said, well, Hey Dean, um, why don't, why don't you start something? And um, you know, we, we, we'd all love to continue working for you. And that was sort of the genesis of my Mm. whole entrepreneurial thing. I decided, well, what could I start? And I ended up starting a, at first, a, a consulting company, believe it or not, uh, building, helping other companies build technology products. And then from there, started my own product company, first product company that was sold and so on. And what led you ultimately, because I, I can imagine that the transition from having and, and being a founder, owning your own company to going back to working for someone else might not be the easiest transition. So can you talk about that a little bit and what ultimately led you to Wilson Paramal? I, as I understand it, you're also a partner there. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, okay. So I, I'm probably still best known for starting a company called Cosine Communications, which mm, I started yes. in 1997. I took it public in September of uh, 2000. So we had a very large IPO on the NASDAQ and I was, uh, the uh, public company CEO for a little while after that. And, um, you know, you might rem- remember 2000, we had the, te- we had the telecom uh, bubble burst mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, large um, well-known communication companies were struggling or, or, you know, um, going out of business or whatever. And uh, many of them are my customers. And so, you know, in that environment, uh, a newly public um, startup company was really struggling. I, I ended up leaving and I had, that was my second company I'd started and I decided to take a break after that. You know, you, you startup companies take a lot out of, out of uh, the, the people who start them. Mm-hmm. But I took, a, I took some time off and after that, I decided to come back. You know, I spent a lot of time on the general management side as a CEO and I decided to sort of come back into the business again as a CTO, mm. um, you know, to just kind of re- reconnect with technology innovation that, you know, that that's kind of the heart of my background is as an engineering person. Mm. And, um, and yeah, so along the way after, after Cosign, I did end up um, helping to start another company that was sold to Dell. But right around that time, I had met Andre and Steven, the co-founders of Wilson Paramol. They had written a book called Waging War on Complexity Costs, which became a, you know, best-selling business book on the subject of complexity. Uh, you know, we, we believe at Wilson Paramount that we're living in what we call the age of complexity, right? That, that, mm. that companies are struggling, you know, to grow without while complexity in the business is actually limiting their capacity to grow or to do so profitably. And so that book w- was uh, very successful. Andre and Stephen ended up sort of starting the consulting firm on the on the back of that book. And 
And uh, a couple of years after I met them through a friend, a mutual friend, and um, really, you know, just was struck by the themes that um, were, you know, sort of behind their motivation to start a practice that was focused on the on complexity and struck by their understanding of the subject. And so over the, the ensuing years, even though I was running other companies, I joined uh, Wilson Paramount's advisory board. And I've actually been on the company's advisory board probably for going on nine, 10 years on the firm's advisory board. And so I've been associated with the firm for a long time. And mm. then uh, two and a half years ago, I, I uh, uh, decided to, um, I was the CTO at a company called Persistent Systems, and I decided to uh, to leave and come in as a partner at Wilson Paramall to help with a, a large AI project that we had sold to the U.S. Army. And um, so I came in to uh, do that project uh, and, and be the partner responsible for our digital transformation um, clients. So yeah, I've known the firm for a long time and I really um, got to kind of get my, my feet wet with, as, as a practitioner in the Wilson Paramol, you know, complexity approach to uh, consulting and uh, over the years. And so, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't just a brand new, new thing for me. I, I knew the firm, I knew its clients. And uh, there was an opportunity for us to make a big difference to the U.S. Army, and so that's that's how I got here. That's really that's a really cool story. And and speaking of th- this AI, this very large AI project that essentially brought you in as the brought you into the role of CTO. Excuse me. Uh, I'm curious, how long has the the company itself been around? So I think the firm is probably. And 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 I might be off by a year or something. It's probably about twelve years old. Twelve, okay, okay. Yeah. And I'm sure you know, as you as you just alluded to, Dean, you've you've been at this for a very long time, so you've seen so much. You've seen the evolution, and I think it's it's really interesting the the company being centered around helping companies grow without increasing complexity. And again, going back to what actually brought you into that role as CTO being a large AI project, artificial intelligence. But I know we're going to talk today a little bit more about RPA, robotic process automation. So I'm wondering, in in, in your most basic definition for the layman who might, might be listening right now, what exactly is robotic process automation? I know, I know, it was just starting to get good, right? Well, there's more where that came from. To listen to the full interview, be sure to click the link in the description box below. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that notification bell so that you'll know when our next episode drops. Until then, keep operating smoothly. Join us next week for another episode of Business Infrastructure with Alicia Butler-Pierre.